All right, I thank God for this privilege to be here today to minister God's word. And I want to appreciate the, the founder of this ministry, the one God has given this vision. Uh, he has been my friend for over 10 years now, or for several years. We met on campus. We stayed in the same lodge. During that time, we were still searching for direction. We were still very, very unstable. And then, but I thank God that today, God is helping him, and God is also helping us together. And then, I want to appreciate him especially as a person of Pastor Ajile Tomisi. And I must also appreciate the members of his crew, and then, his ministry partners thank you so much for holding the forth for him and then for ensuring that the purpose of God is established even in our generation um, very quickly let's quickly pray father we thank you for this privilege to minister your word thank you for the life you have given unto us thank you father for the grace that you have supplied into our lives to be able ministers of the new covenant. Thank you, Father, for where you are taking us to. Thank you for the several encounters we have had. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings you have released upon us. As we go into your word, we have that you grant us clarity, you grant us trust, and everyone that will listen to this or that will be listening to this shall be greatly blessed, edified, and empowered to fulfill the purpose of God in his or her life in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, because you have had us for in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. All right, very quickly, we are considering the topic God's kingdom and governance. God's kingdom and governance. This is an interesting topic. Taking the God's kingdom and the governance alongside each other. Because we live in a world that is governed by men. We live in a world that is also governed by God. So when we talk about God's kingdom, we are talking about the sovereignty of God. We are talking about the sovereignty and the rulership of God over all creation. And any sphere which the wisdom and the will of God is fully realized. That is where or what we refer to as the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God can be territorial. It can also be localized in the person. All right? You can say, okay, the kingdom of God is established over the earth. The kingdom of God exists in heaven. And then, but most importantly, God wants his kingdom to be established in our hearts, in the hearts of men. So, God's kingdom is the fulfillment of God's purposes wherever his purposes are being fulfilled, that means the kingdom of God has been established in such a place. And then I would like to begin with this scripture, Mark chapter 4, verse 30 to 32. You know, the, Jesus Christ attributed the kingdom of God to several things in his parables. In Mark chapter 4, verse 30, let me quickly read from here. He said, Then he said, To what shall we liken the kingdom of God, or what will or with what parable shall we picture it? It is like a mustard seed, which when it is sown on the ground, is smaller than all the seeds on the earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs, and shoot out large branches, shoot out, out large branches, so that the best of the year may nest under its shade. Right. Now, Jesus Christ was and leading the kingdom of God to a grain of mustard seed. That means the kingdom of God is like the word of God in our heart, the seed of the word of God in our hearts. And when that seed is planted in our heart and it is permitted and allowed to germinate, to prosper, that single seed has the capacity to cover the whole realm of the whole earth. And such is the nature of the kingdom of God. God wants his kingdom to be established in our hearts. 
And once it is established in our heart, it has the capacity to influence. I love that word, influence. Because when you are talking about kingdom, you are talking about influence. When you are talking about governance, you are also talking about influence. Alright? So, God's kingdom is characterized by certain values. Values like righteousness, like peace, like love, like um, joy in the Holy Ghost, like justice. So these are the funda- foundations and the fundamental attribute of God's kingdom. But let's look. Let's quickly go into governance and um, vis-a-vis God's kingdom. Governance, then vis-a-vis God's kingdom. Now, when we talk about governance, governance is a system of man. It's a system established by man whereby the needs of men are met. You know, the disciple has Jesus. I said, Master, are you about to restore the kingdom to Jerusalem at this time? Now, what they were thinking was that they were thinking about the political leadership of Jesus. They thought Jesus Christ came to lead a political revolution for Jerusalem or for Israel. He said, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They didn't know that Jesus Christ has come to establish his kingdom, an eternal kingdom upon the earth. And then when you even look at the characteristics of the character of Jesus, it looks as though Jesus Christ was not even interested in politics, in governance, and the lives. When you look at the character of Jesus Christ, even when you look at the tone of the New Testament, it looks as though the concept of civic responsibility is not really emphasized. All you see is the spiritual dimension, you see ministry outflow, ministry, um, ministry, what, what have you. But when you look at the character of the Bible entirely, everything is holistic. When you look at the Old Testament, you see examples of governance, you see examples of leadership, you see examples of nation building. And we are going to be talking more about that uh, today. Now, the first reference of governance in this scripture, because whenever we are discussing anything, there's something they call the law of first mention. We must go back to the beginning. Where is it mentioned first? All right? Governance might not have been mentioned in the scripture, but the character of governance is there in the word of God. When God created the first man, Adam, what was the instruction he gave to man? After he blessed him, the Bible said that he blessed man. And the first instruction he gave to him was that be fruitful. Let's look at Genesis. I think Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, if I'm right. Please quickly let me confirm. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. It said, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish. Now, the word dominion there is still talking about kingdom, is talking about influence, is talking about uh, leadership. Over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle. So, verse 27 says, God created man in his own image. 28. Then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful, be multiply, I mean, and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So God said, be fruitful. And the second thing he said to man was that, have dominion. He said, multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it, and then have dominion. So the word dominion there is talking about governance. It's talking about not only really dominating men, but answering to the means and the affairs of men. So right from the creation, creation, we saw the concept of kingdom and governance. Psalm 103 verse 19, the Bible says that the Lord had prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruled over all. So God rules. He has his own kingdom where he rules, where he has the preeminence, where he dominates everywhere. Then, but Psalm 115 verse 16 now says, The heaven 
even the heavens are the Lord's. But the heart he has given to the children of men. So when we are talking about governance, we are talking about the authority God has given to the children of men so that the needs of men can be catered for, so that the security of men can be taken into perspective. Alright? So God is involved in the affairs of men. You know, just like God is also involved, Satan himself is also involved when it comes to governance. But before I go into that, let me quickly define what governance is. I said governance is about having a legal access or authority to the resources for the welfare of the people. That means when you are called to come and govern the people, you have authority and then you have access to unlimited or maybe limited resources. Maybe in the case of our country now, you have limited resources to lead the people. But we can also say in this context that you have unlimited access to whatever the resources you have, whether limited or, or unlimited. But I think uh, economics taught us that um, the needs of men are what? Are enormous. They are insatiable. But the resources for meeting those needs are what? They are limited. So let's just set to it whether the resources are limited or not. There's a resources or there are resources that you have been given authority and access to to administer such resources towards the needs of men. Now let's look at the book of Esther. Esther chapter 10 verse 3. This is a man, we are still going to talk about this man called Mordecai because we are going to be talking about how to get to the position of power as believers. Now because this is an area when, where it has been really, really de-emphasized. You are talking about politics, you are talking about governance. Maybe it is now, recently, that the church is waking up to see that there is a need for believers to begin to have their say when it comes to governance. And you know, politics is just a means of bringing people into governance. There are people who came into governance without passing through the process of politics. But when you come into I mean, governance, there is a need for you to understand politics. And you know, politics is not even exclusive to what you have in our political system. Even in church, there's politics. Anywhere there is a system of leadership. If you don't know how to play politics there, you may be etched out. All right? So that is not my emphasis. But maybe we still come into that. But it is important for us to have this understanding and perspective of our civic responsibility as believers. Because Jesus, God said that, he said he has created us. He has redeemed us unto our God. I think... Revelation chapter 5, verse 10. He said, He has redeemed us unto our God to become what? Kings and priests. I was trying to say that the tone of the New Testament talks mainly about our priesthood. But when you look at, is it 1 Peter 9, chapter 2, verse 10, when he was talking about um, you are a royal priesthood. So it links both royalty and priesthood together. That means. You, a priest is someone who represents God before the people. No, the other way around. That's a king. A king represents God before the people. Why a priest represents men before God? So as a priest, you have access to God. In those days, when you have priesthood in the book of Exodus, in the time of Aaron, all those Aaronic priesthood and the likes, it is only those who have been anointed as priests that have the capacity to come before God, to represent men before God. Now, kings are those people that God has ordained to go and represent God before men. So in the Old Testament, you have the two, because you, 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 you see someone like Melchizedek. The Bible says that this Melchizedek was a king of Salem, and he was also a priest forever. So you saw that. So God wants us to perpetuate this order in the New Testament. That, you know, what, he came, what Jesus Christ came to do, actually, he came to establish a spiritual order. 
But in this spiritual order, we are still living in the system of man. We are still living in this realm. We are not living as though all we came to do is just to do ministry. Even though all our entire life, our life itself is a ministry. I believe you know that what I'm doing is not what is called ministry. It's just a means. My life is my ministry. So I can teach here, but ministry is not complete until those I am teaching and those and the person that is teaching is living the life of what is taught or what is being taught. That is ministry. Ministry is not just standing before pulpits. It is a means to an end. And that is why the life of Christ, I love Jesus. You know, we are coming to um, Esther. I said we are reading Esther chapter 10 verse 3 to see a man who govern well. When you see the life of Christ, Jesus Christ was not going about organizing events. He was just living his life. But anywhere he went to, that life flow. There's a flow of life in him. He didn't call anybody and say, let us organize a teaching ministry yeah, or a teaching event. Jesus Christ was all going about. The Bible said that our God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with Holy Ghost and power. And he went about what? Doing good. And what was he doing? He was healing. He was delivering. So the life of Jesus was such that one that his life was his ministry. So if he gets to anywhere, anywhere was his pulpit. He can teach anywhere. He can heal anywhere. And that should be our life too. That when I'm in church, I must not only teach when I have pulpit. When, I'm a, when I am among my brethren, my words should communicate the life that I carry. I was it Apostle Paul and I was it? I say, let your word be seasoned with salt. He said, let you communicate with grace. Let your communication be filled with grace. Let it be favored. Let it be served with grace. So that is ministry. All right? So it is not only limited to pulpit. If I'm only being trained to talk like this, then I have gotten a wrong perspective of ministry. So in the New Testament, you have that, and that is why when you see the disciples, all they were doing about was just that, the spiritual perspective of ministry. They were preaching, they were healing, so they didn't have time to go and govern. Even Jesus Christ, they called him and said, come and lead us, come and become king. That was not the purpose of Jesus Christ. But I can become a king and I am fulfilling the purpose of God through that kingship. So just like someone who is a teacher in his class can stand before his, uh, his student and is teaching, he's, there's a flow and as flow of life of Christ in him. So whether you are into politics, you are into governance, you are into business, the fact is that that life of Christ must flow through us. And that is the emphasis of the New Testament. So I will say, let us read Esther chapter 10, verse 3. Esther 10, verse 3. Who is there to read for me? Before oh, I quickly... Okay. Okay. For Mordecai the Jew was next unto King Ahasuerus. Okay. And great among the Jews. Mm -hmm. And accepted of the multitude of his brethren. All right. Seeking the wealth of his people. And speaking peace to all his people. Thank you so much. Sir. He was seeking the wealth of his people. And the Bible said that he was speaking peace. Okay, now look at it. He said, Mordecai, the Jew, was second to King Ahasuerus. Now, his position is mentioned here that he has entered into governance. He is now a leader. What is now the purpose of governance? They said that he was well received by the multitude of his brethren. Now, look, this is a testimony. That means for him to be well received by the multitude of his brethren, he has done well. Thank you, sir. He is responding to the needs of his people. He's responding to the welfare of his people. And that is why if you have a president or a leader that is responding to the needs of his men, the Bible says that he will be well received of his people. He will be well received by the multitude of his brethren. So when you see people talking against multitude, talking against their leaders, then it shows that there has not been an impact of the governance of such a leader in their life. Now, secondly, 
He said he was seeking the good of his people. That was a mentality that Mordecai carried. He was seeking the good of his people. And speaking peace to all his countrymen. That means he was seeking the, the, the security and the welfare of his people. I wish that we can have it this read in different versions of the Bible. It could have been very, very, very interesting to have it read in the in the in the different okay amplify sir thank you esther chapter 10 verse 3 okay um amplified yes sir for mordecai the jew was next to the king Ahasuerus. okay and great among the jews hmm. and was a favorite with the multitude of his brethren favorite with the multitude of his brethren for he sought the welfare of his people and okay. spoke peace for his whole race. He sought the welfare of his people and spoke peace to his whole race. Thank you, sir. Can we have any other version? Okay, NIV. NIV. Uh, it says, Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Xerxes, uh -huh. preeminent among the Jews, mm. and held in high esteem by his many fellow Jews. Mm. But, sorry. Because he worked for the good of his people. He worked for the good of his people. So when you see anybody, thank you, sir, who is into governance, and um, this is not his aim, there's such a person has gone there to represent himself and not to represent the interest of God. The Living Bible says he did his best for his people and was a friend at court. For all of them. So we see a leader who is a Christian in court, who is a believer in court because he belongs to the people of God, is a Jew. And the Bible said that he was responding to the needs of his people. Now, that is the purpose of governance at a surface level. Now, the second purpose which is the eternal purpose why god sent men into governance is found in the book of esther that same book of esther i think um where is it where mordecai told esther i think chapter two where mordecai told esther and said that um, if you hold your peace at this point he said you and all your house will be destroyed and he asked a question. He said, who knows whether what you are in such, whether you are in government for such a time as this. I wish I can find that scripture. I think Esther chapter 2. Is it 2 now or 5? Where, where um, Herman has orchestrated the destruction of the Jews. And because of that, Esther was, uh, Esther was still enjoying the palace. She was still enjoying the, the paraphernalia, the aesthetics of the palace. And then um, so there was a decree that had been made already by Haman. Okay, chapter 3, right? Thank you, sir. Chapter 3, verse what? Um, okay. Things should be chapter four. Okay, chapter three was where Haman sent out the letter. Yes. Letter. Okay, let's look at Esther chapter four, verse fourteen. Okay. Esther four fourteen. Yeah, it says, "For if though all together orders thy peace, yes, sir. Hmm. For if though all together orders thy peace at this time, hmm. then shall there enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. Hmm. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Thank you so much, sir. I love this scripture. I love this scripture and then it gives us a sense of purpose. That wherever you belong to, wherever you find yourself, whether in government, whether in business, there is a divine purpose that God wants to fulfill where he has led you to. 
So Mordecai was charging Esther, his spiritual daughter. You know, it was Mordecai that trained Esther. Esther had been living with Mordecai from when she was young. And then Mordecai tutored her. Mordecai discipled her and she became, until she became the queen in the palace. And you know, you understand the drama that happened that brought Esther in. And you know, when God wants to bring us in, there's a way he creates vacancies. When, you know, we are still, get, try, we are still going to how to get into position. because. But let's establish this foundation now that we enter into governance to establish God's kingdom in that place. We enter into governance, that is the system of man, where there is leadership, where there is rulership. There is a divine purpose behind our being orchestrated into governance. So if you find, find God moving you, if you get, find the spirit of God orchestrating your way, if you find the spirit of God, the Bible says that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. If you find the spirit of God ordering your steps into areas like politics, into places like governance, you must know that you are not going there to represent yourself. You are not going there because of the, of the rights and the privileges of those offices. Whether the, the private car they will give to you, or the, the, the orderly they will put around you, or all kinds of, all kinds of benefits that people keep themselves for today in order to get involved in, in, in politics and in governance. But we must know that there's a divine agenda. There's a divine purpose why God wants to bring us into the place of human governance system. But not much teachings have gone into this area. You see people going to governance, they mess up, they join it. And then I think, maybe, in fact, they even, they even, they, there was even a time that believers were instructed or were taught not to get involved in politics because of this popular mantra that politics is a dirty game. Yes, it is a dirty game. But when you look at someone like Daniel, where he ruled, how many believers did he rule in the midst of? When he was reigning in Babylon, was he reigning? How many churches were in Babylon? These people were, were idol worshippers. In fact, all his colleagues, except the three Hebrews, they were idolaters. They were sorcerers. They were magicians. They were all these guys. These were the people that Daniel was interacting with. And yet, Daniel was not contaminated. You know, I've been saying this, this, this thing anywhere I go to talk about leadership and governance that Daniel is our template when it comes to operating in the secular, operating in the governance system of man. Daniel is the template. And we are still going to look at the characteristic and the lifestyle of Daniel, of how he was able to subdue Babylon and establish the kingdom of God in that kingdom. So we were talking about Esther and Mordecai, that Mordecai asked Esther that, who knows whether you are in such a position, you are in the palace for just such a time as this? He was asking her. And then, you know, thank God that Esther sat up and she understood that I am in such a position today for a reason. All right? So, God brings us into governance for an eternal reason to preserve his people. You also saw that um, in Daniel, God brought Daniel into position so that it can give us a template of the kingdoms to come. You will see that Daniel began to give prophecies about the kingdoms to come and ultimately about the kingdom of God. Now, you can also see in the times of um, Joseph, Joseph was orchestrated into the palace of Egypt in order to fulfill the purpose of God. When, when his brothers came to him and they were regretting what they did, what they did to him, how they sold him into slavery. In fact, how they killed him in quotes because they have already prepared to kill him. It was just one of his brothers that said, let's not kill him. Let us sell him. Thank God they sold him. But in their mind, they have killed him. With his father, he has been killed. But Daniel, I mean, Joseph responded to them and said, you did it in, you thought you sold me. 
But what happened is that you didn't sell me. What happened is that God sent me here to fulfill a purpose, to preserve a posterity for him. So someone like Daniel, I mean, someone like Joseph was sent into the palace of Egypt to fulfill a particular purpose. So we have many people like that that were sent into the palace, but there is a reason for them being sent into that palace. So whenever we are going into any place, if our ways are being moved into governance, let us understand that there is a purpose behind our being sent into governance. All right. So we have established it that there's an internal purpose. There is a will. There's, there's, there is an intention in the heart of God that he wants to achieve. And the secondary to it is that the welfare of people is taken care of. All right. So we saw, we even saw Daniel. I mean, we, we saw Daniel answering to the welfare of the people. He became the, he became the president. We saw he became an administrator. We saw Joseph administering to the welfare of the people of Egypt. Then Moses also came to mind. He was sent into the palace to be raised. And you know, that is why we don't kill ourselves to enter into the palace. Sometimes God can send you into the palace to fulfill his purpose. And sometimes God can send you out of the palace to fulfill his purpose. When there was a time for Moses to respond to the ultimate, ultimate purpose why he was sent to the palace initially, what happened to Moses was that he was sent out of the palace. All right? So God can send you into the palace to fulfill his purpose, governance, and God can also send you out of the palace to fulfill his purpose. So I'm talking about Moses now. He was sent initially into the palace of Egypt to be trained, to be raised. We saw the circumstances that happened when they wanted to kill. Then when they were killing all the male children in Egypt in those days. But God, by his wisdom, preserved Moses and sent him into the palace to be trained and to be groomed up for his task. And when the, the time came for him to fulfill the ultimate task and purpose of God in his life, God said, oh yeah, it is time. And that is why when you go to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 11, when God was talking, when, when the Bible was talking about the, the heroes of faith, he said by faith, Egypt forsook, I mean, Moses forsook Egypt. He forsook the palace because he saw him who is what? He was seeing the invisible. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. So we saw and we have been able to establish now that God sent his men into governance for a divine agenda and for a divine purpose and also to cater for the welfare of his people. Now, let's go to the second aspect of this teaching. It is how to get to the position of power. Now that we know that God sends men into power, God sends men into politics, God sends men into, 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 into governance. How does God do this? Or if you feel that God is wiring you, you are feeling a kind of a sense of responsibility towards governance. How do you go about it? And you know, just like I said when we started that, in the New Testament, you can hardly see a resemblance of politics. Even in the Old Testament, you can hardly see, in fact, I have not even seen, one of the reasons why I have not declared myself to, to, to play the political game or to enter into politics is because I have not seen its pattern in the scriptures. All right? So maybe it's an invention of man. Actually, democracy is an invention of man. What is the definition of democracy? <laughs> Government of the people, by the people, and for the people. So you don't see the mention of God here. You don't see the government of God here by the people or by God when you, when you are talking about God's kingdom. <laughs> or to the globe. When you are talking about God's kingdom. So let's define God's kingdom in terms of, of democracy. If democracy is defined as the government of the people by the people and for the people, how should you define God's kingdom in terms to make it look like democracy? The government, <laughs> government from God, government from God, by God, by God, by God, God and for God, God, and to the people. 
<laughs> and for God's glory. So I'm seeing a definition, a new definition now of God's kingdom here. Government from God, government of God, from God, by God, by God to, to the, the people, people, maybe and through for men, <laughs> for the glory of God. Thank you so much for that wonderful definition. So democracy is not popular. In fact, I think the only place where you see democracy was when they wanted to crucify Jesus. And then they said, they were asking them, what should we do to Jesus Christ? And the people were called, crucify him, release unto us Barabbas, crucify him. That was the only place where you see democracy. But when you look at the concept of how God brings men into leadership and into governance, it was God himself that orchestrates men into governance. So, Let's take example. For example, the kingdom of Israel. You know, when we are talking about Israel, we are talking about a domain of God Himself. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, and that is why we can't. We can't sometimes when when we are when we come to the times of a, a political season, when you begin to see certain prophecies coming out. But this is the person that I win. This is the person that I win. This is the person God said he win. And oftentimes we have seen that. All those prophecies don't come to pass. And we begin to ask ourselves, what is going on? You know? But I, <laughs> I am saying this, this is my own opinion, that it looks as though God is not even interested in our politics. It looks as though God is not... Say, because you are the one choosing who you want. So if God says, okay, uh, I give you this, you will still be the one to choose. So it has defeated the system of God. But in the Old Testament, okay, look at, Adam was the first leader we saw. It was God that brought him. And we can see Abraham, we can see Isaac, and let's fast forward to when God began kingship in Israel. So when God began the system of kingship in Israel, who was the first king he brought? Saul. So we saw how God orchestrated Saul into leadership. So, people can come into leadership by divine appointment. We saw Saul, we saw David. David himself was anointed to become the king in Israel. So, sometimes we can't compare the Israelite system of governance to Nigeria or to Kenya or to whatever, wherever we have a democracy. We can't compare them to with one another. So when we are getting God, God involved in our politics, in our democracy, we must do that with understanding and not with the understanding of how God was relating with them in Israel. Because then it was God himself that was in charge. So it determines who becomes the leader. Hallelujah. Amen. So God can do that by divine appointment. And if God has appointed you as a leader, how does God bring you in? The second one is by problem solving and productivity. So we are looking at practical means where people can be orchestrated into the position of power. The second one is what? Problem solving and productivity. Who can give me an example of a leader that solved problem and he became a leader? I think we have mentioned them here as we started. They solved problem of the people and then they said, ah, you are, you are much more than this position you are. You are much more than this. Let us bring you. You have been able to solve a little problem. Let us bring you into governance. Can I have that example of one person? Joseph, Joseph is an example. Thank you. There was a problem in the land. In fact, the king had a dream. And nobody could interpret it. So Joseph solved a problem for the king. And then they were asking. Ah, so... And you know, Joseph described the, 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 the dream was in terms of governance, how people, how the welfare of the people would be catered and cared for. And the king said, Ah, we have searched everywhere. We have not seen anybody, anyone as wise as you. Why not take that position? So Joseph became a, he entered into governance. He became a notable leader. Where was in Egypt, right? In Egypt. Because he solved a problem. Who has solved a problem and became a leader? Daniel. Daniel also solved a problem. It was also a problem of um, a problem of dreams. The king had a dream. 
I think I think he interpreted dream, the dream a dream twice. Let's look at Daniel chapter two forty seven to 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 forty nine, so that um, I won't just be talking off and let's talk from scriptures. Daniel chapter five or Daniel chapter two. Daniel is after Ezekiel. Daniel chapter two and verse forty seven to forty nine. Daniel 2, 47 to the right. Let me start from 46. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel, and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. <laughs> they wanted to worship Daniel here. The king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets. Since you could reveal this secret, then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts. And he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon. He made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon. So Daniel came into leadership. He came into governance by solving the king's problem. And chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. You see, this is where the enmity began to come. And that is why we are still going to talk about how to conduct instructions. To how to live in governance because governance i was saying the other day i wanted to say that both god and satan they are interested in who governs men both god and satan they are interested in who, who whoever becomes the leader of me and that is why god doesn't take leadership with levity he doesn't he takes leadership seriously he wants to be the one in charge of those or he wants to be the, the one in charge of choosing leadership for his people because who becomes a leader of the people becomes the determines the direction of the people so that is why satan himself is also involved in who become the leader of the people he knows that the because the culture of the leader becomes the culture of the people the character of the of the leader becomes the character of the people the mindset of the leader becomes the mindset of the people so when you have a leader that fears God, and that is why the Bible says that when the righteous are in power, it said the people what? They rejoice. But when the wicked are in power, then all kinds of evil happen to men. Amen. So God and Satan, they are involved. When Daniel, I mean, when David came into leadership, you will see how Satan was also bringing his people. Immediately Saul died. You know, God has already prepared Saul's replacement in, 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 in place of David. When Saul died, very quickly a man called Abner. Abner was the chief of staff or the, the chief warrior of Saul. So when Saul died, Abner quickly made an arrangement to bring one of the sons of Saul to become the king. Now, that is how Satan works. He tries to quickly make arrangement to see that he brings someone into leadership that does not represent the intentions and the plans of God. And you can see that he also tried it in, in, in is it Absalom now? Who was that? The, 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 one of the kings, one of the sons of um, David. I think it was Absalom, right? Who, who usurped the king. The Bible said that he will come to the gates and then he will turn in. Absalom, thank you. Sir. He stole the heart of the people. That's also, that's also what we are talking about when we, talk, when we are talking about power. So power is a place where the interest of God and the interest of devil also lies. So you have people who also carries the interest, either personal interest or the interest of the devil. They bring it into the palace to ensure that their selfish interest or the interest of, the, of Satan, their devil, is, um, is perpetuated. So we saw these people. When God, when Daniel was promoted into the position of leadership. The Bible said that he promoted them over all the wise men in the province of Babylon. And you can see where the enmity started. And they began to, 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 what is, what is that English now they use? They began to um, conspire against this leader. All right? So when you also look at Daniel chapter 5, Daniel chapter 5, very quickly, he also solved another problem there. There was a problem of the king. There was a handwriting on the wall, 
and the, all the, the leaders, all the wise men, all the magicians, they couldn't also provide an answer to this. So they came to, 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 to call Daniel. When you look at chapter, chapter 27, Daniel chapter 5, from verse 27. But if you read the whole story, it's talking about the problem and how Daniel was recommended again to solve this problem. And then, then verse 29, then Beshazzar gave the command and they closed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then that very night, Beshazzar, king of Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius, the middle passive of the kingdom, being about 62 years old. So we also saw Daniel that was brought into the position of power here. He became taught ruler of the kingdom. And let me quickly say this humorously. I think I've noticed, in the, noticed it in the scripture. That it looks as though God doesn't bring his people to become the number one. In the kingdom of men. In the affairs of the governance of men. When you look at someone like Joseph, he became the second. Someone like Daniel, this one said he became third. If you look at Mordecai, I think we have read Mordecai in, in Esther chapter 3, verse 10. He said he was second to King Ahasuerus. And who else again? You see, people like Esther, he was, she was, um, she was um, the queen and the like. So, and all these people, they were in a strange land. It was not in the system of God, it was not in Israel. When you come to Israel, Jerusalem, God himself brings the leaders or leadership to be the number one. But when they are estranged outside, mm. he has not usurped the leadership of those realms. He didn't remove uh, Pharaoh for, 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 for Moses. He didn't remove um, Pharaoh for, for Joseph. He didn't remove all these kings that Daniel reigned with for, for Daniel. Who else again? He didn't remove King Ahas. Was it Ahas that was there now in the times of Mordecai for Daniel? So God brought them. So I don't know why he does that. So maybe if you do further studies, we can get it. So maybe, maybe so that um, they can escape certain heat. That is just you know. There was a time we had, we had a vice president who is a Christian, a genuine child of God, and he was second, and everybody was thinking that ah, he would be the first. We were praying. In fact, personally, I was even, <laughs> I was not even, I was not a politician, but I became an emergency politician. <laughs> I was campaigning for this person to become the president. I know, in fact, I even saw, I stumbled across a scripture. And that person painted that script, I mean, sorry, not a scripture, a prophecy. That person print, painted this prophecy that, oh, see, sorry, that this vice president, <laughs> this vice president, was going to become the president of our nation. You know, but if he came second, we don't know why he was not permitted to be first. We wouldn't know. And maybe it should. It could have been, but we don't know. But when you look at it in the system and the governance of man, and it is because, you know, the Bible says that the throne of God is established in righteousness. Abina, the kingdom of God is established in righteousness, but the kingdom of men is not established in righteousness. And I think that is where God is still taking us to. That we take... Do you know what happened in the times of um, Daniel? The old Babylon converted to Christianity, in quotes. When everything happened with Daniel, it was the king himself that made that announcement that everybody must begin to worship the God of Daniel. You see? So God injected Daniel into that system. So we are still going to look at the behavior of Daniel in the system and how he was able to establish God's kingdom in Babylon. Don't forget we said when we started that the purpose of God bringing us into position of leadership, into governance, is that so he can establish his kingdom there and so that the welfare of the people can also be met. All right? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Are we together? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you so much. So we also saw Nehemiah chapter 5. We are looking at problem solving and productivity. You also remember the parable of Jesus Christ. When he said, the parable of the talent. The Bible said that he gave one five, he gave the other two, and he gave the other one one. 
He now said, go and make, go and do business with them. And when they did business with them, they traded with them. And by the time they came back, those ones who traded and became productive in what they were given, what was their reward? They gave them what? The Bible said that one, they gave them 10 cities. It was a reward of governance they gave to them. They didn't give them more. One said they gave them 10 cities. So they gave, they gave them rulership and governance as a reward. So when you are productive where you are, God can also orchestrate you into governance. They just see that, ah, this person has traded with his skill. And that is why even the person that became the vice president I was talking about, how he got there, he got there because of this productive nature. It was productive. Everywhere, it could be in wherever, whatever uh, craft or whatever um, profession you have chosen. God can bring you into governance if you are skillful and if you are also productive in that aspect. So God can bring you into governance. So we also saw um, Mordecai, who was brought, what was he, what, uh, what did he do? What did Mordecai do that he was brought into governance? He's, he saved the king. Thank you, sir. He solved a problem. There was a problem that he solved for the king. The king could have been killed. But he solved that problem. And when they knew that, ah. But behind all, the, all these things, there is God behind it, orchestrating things to happen. But he was using things and events and circumstances to bring men. And the last person I will talk on, on that aspect of problem solving and productivity, is Jephthah. Maybe I've skipped Nehemiah, right? Nehemiah also became, became a governor. Do you know he became a governor? Let's read Nehemiah chapter 5. Let's quickly, let's quickly look at Nehemiah chapter 5, 14 to 15. Hmm. Time is going. Nehemiah 5, 14 to 15. Nehemiah 5. Nehemiah 5. Where is Nehemiah said? Okay, I've seen it. Nehemiah 5. 14 to 15. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah. I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah. From the 20th year until the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes. 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the governor's provisions. And this is someone who came into leadership, who came into governance with a sense of responsibility. Why many people are coming to governance to eat the national cake and to make it their own exclusive property? This man said, he said, for I neither did what, neither I nor my brothers ate the governor's provisions. There, you know, there's always a provision that is made for those in governance. There's a wardrobe, wardrobe allowance. There is a, all kinds of benefits. There is a, all kinds of benefits. Travel, travel allowance and all of this. And they, to the detriment of the people. He said, not even myself or any of my brothers partook in all these provisions. You know, when some people come into governance, they empower all their cronies, all their, their family members. They give them portfolios. But the former governors who were before me laid burdens on the people and took from them bread and wine and besides 40 shekels of silver. And that is what we are experiencing today. Instead of the government to be given to us, they are, we are the one giving more. If you, are, if, you are, if you are driving now, you know how much you spend on fuel. You are giving more. This, the, 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 the subsidy we were enjoying before, I'm speaking as a Nigerian. The subsidy we were enjoying before, they took it away. All right? <laughs> so this, Nehemiah was now telling them what happens in governance and what should happen in governance. He said, those who were before me, what they did was that they lay more burden on the people. People began to suffer. People began to complain. People began to murmur. He said, yes, even their servant bore rule over the people. All these small, small servants. But I did not do so because of the fear of God. Because of the fear of God. So anybody who wants to rule, 
he must rule what? In the fear of God. Verse 16 now says, Indeed, I also continued the work on this world, and we did not buy any land. All my servants were gathered here for the work. Amen. Now, this was what brought Nehemiah into leadership. He was productive. He saw a need. He saw a gap. He was not a governor at that time. He was only a servant to another king in a foreign land. He was a servant to another governor. He was a cup bearer to another governor in a, in a foreign land. And when he heard that, ah, the walls of my city have been broken down. The gates have also been burnt thereof. The Bible said that he sat down and he wept. He didn't only weep, he stood up and he prayed. He didn't only do that, he took action, he stepped out to solve the problem of the people. So problem solving, productivity. So if you see yourself that, um, if, you see, if you see any problem around you and you feel that you can solve it, go ahead and solve it. God can use that one to orchestrate you and bring you into power. We saw how Nehemiah eventually became a governor in that land. How did he start? He started by taking responsibility. He started by solving problems. He started by being productive. Amen. Amen. All right. So the last person I wanted to talk about was Jephthah. Jephthah solved the problem of the people. Jephthah is another, is another, is another. Okay, I'm going to talk about him in the last one. The, sec, the third way God brings us into power. I will talk about Jephthah there. But one thing about Jephthah is that he solved the problem of the people. There was a war, and nobody could fight this war for, for the people. And they came to Jephthah. Jephthah went, he solved them, and he became a head over them. The third way God brings us into governance, into position of leadership, so that we can influence the system for, the, for his kingdom, is what I call wise negotiation. And I think maybe this is where politics will come in. You must be able to be wise and negotiate well. Because what happens in politics is negotiation. You know? Negotiation does not only happen in, 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 in business. Negotiation also happens where? In, in governance, in, in politics. Negotiation also happens in politics. So I'm going to use so certain scriptures, maybe two scriptures, about wise negotiation. How God brings people into governance by wise negotiation. Because you can be productive. You can be skillful. You can even solve problems of the people and they still neglect you. We are going to see an example of a man like that. So let me start with Jephthah. Or let me start with uh, this man. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. The Bible called him, who remembers that story? The wise for Ecclesiastes 9, chapter 14 to 18. Ecclesiastes 9, 14 to 18. Okay? It says, There was, let me start from 13. This wisdom I have also seen under the sun, and it seemed great to me. There was a little city with few men, in it, and a great king came against it, besieged it, and built great snares around it. Fifteen. Now there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no one remembered that same poor man. Look at this man. He was in this city, and he became poor. He, was, he still remained where he was. And yet, this man was the one that saved a whole nation. The Bible said that nobody was remembered. In fact, he was not even rewarded. He was not rewarded. And you know, when you are playing around men, you know, it's one thing for you to walk and God rewards you supernaturally. But when you are dealing with the system of man, maybe in terms of politics, if you don't know how to negotiate wisely, they will rob you. They will push you aside. They will use you. Let me use that word. They will use you and what? Pack you aside. So maybe that is where politics comes in in, the, in this scriptural perspective of governance. So we saw this man. He was wise, but yet he was poor. 
He was influential, yet had, he, he had influence, yet not influential. He influenced solution. You, you understand? But he was not brought into the position where he was supposed to be brought into. But let's see a man, a contrast of a wise negotiator. Judges chapter 12, verse 7. Judges 12, 7. Or maybe we start from Judges 11. Let's start from Judges 11. I love some stories in the Old Testament. I love, just like I love, I'm not a Old Testament, New Testament believer. I see some people say, I will only, it is the New Testament that will believe. You know, there will be some people who will tell you that uh, it is only the four Gospels that is authentic in the Bible. Maybe you have not heard them say it before. So people will say, ah, the, the, the four Gospels are part of the Old Testament. Let's stick with the Pauline epistles. That is where the new creation realities were well spread out. You see, the Bible is holistic. The Bible says that all these things were written for examples. They were written so that you can, through them, we can have comfort of, this, of the scriptures. All right? I wanted to read Judges chapter what now? 11. Judges 11, cautious of my time, before I go to the last step, as instructions to those who desire to govern or who are into governance. Judges chapter 11, verse 9. Okay, so let me quickly read verse 9 to 11. So Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, if thou take me back home to fight against the people of Ammon, and the Lord delivers them to me, shall I be your head? Can you say I was negotiating now? Because why? He knew that this, I was supposed to be the head. <laughs> Look at that verse 1 of, of chapter 11. Say Now Jephthah the Legator was a mighty man of valor, but he was the son of a harlot, and Gilead begot Jephthah. Now we know the story. Let me not belabor us with that story. The story is that Jephthah was a son of an allot and the fact that you are illegitimate child. So you are not supposed to be part of our father's inheritance. They sent him out of the house. It, they were unfair to him. They were cruel. They were unkind to him, just like the brothers of Joseph did to him. And that's why men, when men are rejecting you today, don't, don't mourn too much. Don't feel sad too much. When you are rejected, when you, you became an outcast, just go and settle your case with God. God knows how to bring you to become even their head. All right? So they sent him out. And the Bible said that it came to time in the process of time. It came to pass in, after a process of time. There was a problem. I said initially that when God wants to bring you in, he knows how to create a vacancy. When he wanted to bring in Esther, he knew how he created that vacancy. When he wanted to bring in Jephthah, he created a vacancy also. How did he create this vacancy? The Bible says that there was a war between the Ammonites. And these people seem so formidable. These people, so they seem so great that it looks as though they can't conquer the Ammonites. The Gladites couldn't conquer the Ammonites. And they look around. Ah, who can we engage in this battle? Apparently, Jephthah had gone to prepare himself in the bush. And that's why if they despise you, leave them alone. Go and settle your case with God. Be in the secret place. The Bible says that God who sees your labor in the secret place shall do what? He shall reward you openly. So Jephthah went to the secret place. He went to the bush. And he started training. He started building up his capacity. And he did that in such a way that there was nobody that could rule or that could fight that battle for them except Jephthah. And these elders did not have any option than to go back to Jephthah. The person they have rejected, they went back to him. Can you see how God, God has a sense of humor? And that's why if you are doing business with God, you, you, will, you will make profits. All right? So they went back and said, ah, please, Jephthah, come and help us out. But Jephthah knew that these people are cruel people. They are political. These are politicians. If I solve their problem now, they will push me back to the desert. And he negotiated. He said, shall I become your head if I win this battle? And okay, so they struck a negotiation deal with him. All right. Uh, even though they did it reluctantly. But they signed it. Okay, you become our head. So that was how Jephthah went to that battle. 
He solved the problem. He won the battle. And he became the head over them. So people can come into the place of governance. They can come into leadership by wise negotiation. Unlike the poor wise man who couldn't negotiate his way into power. But you must understand that the reason why you are coming into governance is so that you can fulfill the purpose of God therein. Amen. So lastly, let us quickly look at instructions to those who desire to govern. Because it is one thing for you to enter. It is another thing for you to be sustained. Because just like I said, it's a, it's a terrain. You know, when you are talking about power, Everybody is interested in power. I said God is interested in power. Even Satan himself is interested in power. Even men who want to partake of the benefit of political power or positional power, they are wrestling and adjusting. In everywhere there is a power, there is also there is always a wrestling. There is always a juggling. There is always a scrambling to possess it. I told you how Absalom struggled with David in order to win that battle, in order to become the king. And several, several people, how they struggled in order to become the leader wherever they belong to. I'm trying to, to wrap my head around several examples now. In fact, there, there was even a man that, Jeroboam, that when it was time for Solomon to become the leader, Jeroboam quickly orchestrated himself politically just like Absalom did. Absalom too politically, he stole the heart of men and people came to him and then that was how they announced him as a king. And that's why I said that I don't know if God is involved in politics because it, it's always, it always comes with a shrewdness and some kind of um, <laughs> anki panky. Alright? So, we must have certain instructions. Number one instruction I said, be guided by the Holy Spirit. Don't push your head to where the Holy Spirit is not leading you to. Maybe as you also heard that, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be a person of the Spirit. Don't just do things the way others are doing it. Ensure that the Holy Spirit is the one guiding, leading, and orchestrating your steps. Secondly, because I want to run very fast now. Be wise. I've said that, but let me emphasize it here. Be wise. Now, wisdom is the principal raw materials for leadership and for governance. There is no leadership that ex succeeds or that excels without a wise counsel. The Bible says that by wise counsels, thou will wage your own warfare. He said in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. You remember when God wanted to hand over the power to Joshua from Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 34 verse 9. The Bible said that for Joshua was filled with the spirit of wisdom for Moses has laid his hand upon him. So leadership will always need wisdom. Because the Bible said that in, in Proverbs chapter 8, the Bible said that by wisdom, kings reign. By wisdom, princes decree justice. You know, say, yea, all the judges of the earth. Wisdom. You remember Solomon? God asked Solomon, ask me what I will give you. And Solomon thought about it. He said, what is, this? What is that thing that I can need? What is that one thing that we need? That will make me succeed as a, as a leader. And Solomon said, God, give me a wise and an understanding heart. Ah! This request even started God. I said, ah, ah. As if God did not know. God was asking him, who taught you this thing? How come did you know that this is a very, very important aspect of leadership? <laughs> and God said, because you have not asked of the head of your enemies. You have not asked for riches. You have not asked for this. You have not asked for that. I will add these other things to you. So when a man seeks wisdom, it's like when you are seeking the kingdom of God, say, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things shall be added unto you. So when Daniel, I mean, when Solomon asked God for wisdom, 
every other thing was added. So wisdom is the principal raw material for leadership. Even in Daniel, I mean in David, the Bible says that David did it, the David behaved himself wisely. Joab, the the was it Joab now? The chief of uh, the captain of army for for David. I think it was Joab. Yes. Yeah. When Joab wanted to do, there was something he wanted to do. So he, he connived with one woman, one wise woman. And that wise woman told David, he said, your wisdom is like the wisdom of an angel. He said, you know all things in the earth. <laughs> and when you look at Daniel 2, he was wise. He was wise. He was that he was a wise man. He was a wise man. In fact, there was a place that... I think in the book of Ezekiel or in the book of Daniel, sorry, Ezekiel or Isaiah, where God was talking to Satan in terms of, um, what's the name of this, the, this typology of Satan in the book of Ezekiel and um, king of the king of Tyre. Yeah, thank you, sir. And what? And I think the king of Tyre, there's the king of Tyre and there's the other one and the prince, maybe one prince like that. Isaiah. Yes. So, I think God, God was telling that king. He said, you think, he was, he was, he was telling Satan in that. He said, you think you are wiser than Daniel, than Daniel. You think you are, or you are wiser than Daniel. And you know, I was now thinking that how, why is God comparing the wisdom of Daniel with Satan? And that is it. There is something Daniel possesses, and it is called the wisdom of, of Daniel. That makes him succeed. King of sir. King of Babylon. Okay. Thank you, sir. Isaiah. Isaiah what, sir? Isaiah 14. Thank you, sir. Let me quickly read Isaiah 14. I think verse 2 also. Isaiah 14, verse 4. Thank you, sir. Isaiah 14, verse 4. Okay. He said that you will take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. There's a place that says you are wiser than Daniel. That's in Ezekiel. Ezekiel, Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28, thank you, sir. Ezekiel 28, verse what? Verse 3. Ezekiel 28, verse 3. No, the scripture is very interesting. You see things from oh, several pages of the scripture. Say, Behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There's no secret that can be hidden from you. When you read from another version, it looks as though you think in your heart that you are wiser than Daniel, that there is no secret that can be hidden from you. That was the tone of that scripture. So, in the Bible, the word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, Tyre, say unto the prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord of God, because your heart is lifted up, and you say, I am God. I am a God. I sit in the seat of God. You see, right from the beginning, there has been a struggle for power. Satan, can you see why governance is very important? And we cannot just leave it to any other. And you must be, you must, you must be a warrior. And put it that way. If you must sustain yourself in governance, in political leadership, you must be a warrior. Don't just sit there as if nothing is going on, as if, as if, as if people will fight for you. You must be a warrior. Engage angels of God. Engage the spirit of God to fight for you. So you see, you, you see, you see what this man is thinking. He said, I am a God. And you say, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas. Yet you are a man and not God. Though you set your heart as the heart of a God. Behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that can be hidden from you. With your wisdom and your understanding, you have gained riches and yourself. And the, you see, so this is the kind of wisdom that Daniel had, that secrets were open to him. And that is why, you, you see, I saw it in, in David. He was a man who understood secrets. The Bible said that he, was a, he, was, he had the wisdom like the wisdom of an angel, and he knew all things in the earth. This is one of the attributes of a leader. When God brings you to the position of leadership, he wants you to partner with him to know things, to know secret things of God. So that when you sit down, you know when Saul will make a move. 
you sit down, you know where somebody will make a move to hinder you. That, that David knew when he, he knew when to run away from Absalom. He didn't wait and say, ah, let me fight. That's wisdom. And he knew how to use, to plant somebody like uh, Ushai in the camp of Absalom. You know, when Aitofer gave a counsel to Absalom, the Bible said that the, the, the wisdom, the counsel of Aitofer was also like the counsel of what? Is he counsel of an angel now? So when, when Aitofer counsels you, it's like when an angel counsels you. It's like the oracle of God. Thank you, that's the word. He said his counsel is like the oracle of God, as if it came from the mouth of God himself. And you know that politically, Absalom stole Aitofer from the camp of David. And it was still that same wisdom that David used. He sent Ushai, one of the wise men of David. He said, oh, you can't stay here. If you stay here with me, you are not productive. You are not, uh, you are not useful with me here, as far as being here is concerned. It was this was when David ran to an exile. And he sent him to go and counter the counsel of Ahitophel in the camp of Absalom. And that was how David was paid. If not, David would have been finished by the counsel of Ahitophel. So wisdom is very profitable. So, okay? The Bible says, be wise as serpents and be what? Harmless as we said, I am sending you as what now? Among wolves, as sheep among wolves. So when you are going to governance system of man, there are wolves there. I am sending you as sheep, but understand your nature. You are a sheep, you are among them. But while you are behaving as a sheep among them, there is also something you need to carry along with you. It is called the wisdom of serpents. You know, the wisdom of serpent is very strategic, very strategic, very calculative. He knew, he knows the system, he knows the step to take. And that's why one of the ways I, I studied that vice president, I saw, I saw intelligence, I saw, I saw wisdom. Then number three, be prayerful. If you're a leader, be prayerful. Whether you are in governance or out of government, but when you are in the midst of hope, be what? Be prayerful. Daniel six ten. We saw how Daniel was given to prayer. He was given to prayer. The Bible said that he will open his window and will pray, pray three times a day. And he was that this has been his custom from his early days. He was a man of consistent prayer. He was given to prayer. Because it is in the secret place that we generate power. It is in the secret place that we generate wisdom that we need to rule among men. Number four, be diligent, I mean be intelligent and knowledgeable. That's be, be capable. Wisdom. Be diligent and what? Knowledgeable. Daniel chapter 1, verse 4 and Daniel 20. We saw how Daniel ruled because of his intelligence. Don't just be, when God is sending you among men, he doesn't just want to send you there and then you are telling, you are sharing testimony and then you are using some kind of English. He wants to, when you speak, people will love you. <laughs> and I was using this example of a, our vice president, then our former vice president. When he speaks, you, it, you look as if you go and lick his, his mouth. He speaks friendly, intelligent, and knowledgeable about things. Give him anything to speak, it's knowledgeable. Number five, know your consecration. Amen. Know your what? Know your consecration. You know, your consecration is your protection. There's a general consecration for people, but everybody must know a specific consecration. Daniel 1 is, the Bible says, but Daniel has proposed in his heart not to define himself with the person of the king's suit. There has been several interpretations of this. And then whether the king, the food is the food uh, offered to idols, Daniel doesn't want to define himself. That is that is a, a reasonable <laughs> assumption. And the boy you can bring your you can bring several allusions or several deductions from that. What I saw in that thing was like a system of fasting for Daniel. But like a system of fasting. You know, I requested for vegetables. Just give me something that something light. I don't want to be heavy. I want to consecrate my you know he was a man of prayer and he was also a man of fasting. When you look at several chapters in the book of Daniel, you will see fasting, fasting, prayer, fasting, fasting, prayer. So to me, that's my personal interpretation. 
and also maybe assumption too. That that concept, that that purpose in his heart, or that other purpose in his heart, that he will not define himself. He saw it as a defilement. If I begin to eat heavy, I will, you know, when <laughs> if he has been heavy, and when the lion saw him, they will have torn him. <laughs> they would have scattered him. But maybe when he entered into that cave, when he entered into that cave, that, they couldn't see anything in him that is edible. <laughs> you know, he re- uh, was it vegetable he requested for? <laughs> oh my God. Let me quickly check so that I won't assume whether it is vegetable. Daniel 1 8. Okay, Daniel 1 8. He said, Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not divide his power. And verse 9. Now God brought Daniel and the children of Enoch and he appointed them. Why should you? Where is that food? I fear my Lord. I was appointed your food and drink. Where did they? Okay, and they requested of the chief of Enoch that he might not divide himself. Now God has brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs and the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink for why would he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age then you will endanger your head before the king and Daniel said to the steward whom the chief and like, please test, test your servant for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink so vegetables and water to drink that was what they were consuming so maybe you know, um, lions are not. <laughs> Is it abibos? Lions are not abibos. That's just my own deduction. So maybe when they saw in the spirit, <laughs> they penetrate to what is inside this guy. <laughs> they can't see meat. They can't see any. It was vegetables. That was just by the way. But Daniel consecrated himself. So you must have a system of consecration that you know. This is what is going to save you. When people are plotting, you, this, is, this is what is going to save you. For, for Joseph, he said, how can I do this great thing and sin against God? Because they will send several traps for you. Your consecration is going to be your defense in this system of governance of man. Then lastly, lastly, have character. Be a person of character. Character is a major requirement in leadership. Right from the Old Testament to the New Testament, when Jethro met Moses, he said, What you are doing is not good. You need to appoint leaders. And he gave him the criteria. He said, Able men. Able men. Ah, where is that scripture? Exodus 18 18 to 21. Able men. Exodus. Let me quickly read from there. Exodus 18. Exodus 18. 18 to 21. All right? So he said, Moreover, you shall select from the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place them over to be rulers. Men of able men, one, able there, talks about capacity, talks about ability. Then the second one said, Men who fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, talking about character. Character. Then, when you look at Acts 6, verse 3, Acts 6, 3, when they wanted to choose leaders, the deacons, what was the criteria? Acts 6, verse 3 said, Look ye among men, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Can you see wisdom coming here again? Whom we may appoint over this business. So character is an essential part of leadership. So I have come to the end of this discussion. In summary, you know, we are looking at God's kingdom and governance. God brings many to governance in order to establish his kingdom. He brought Daniel there, he established his kingdom. He brought Joseph in, he established his kingdom. He brought in... Um, Esther, the established kingdom, he brought in Mordecai, his kingdom was established, and several men like that. You are not going into governance for your personal aggrandizement. You are not going there 
for your personal benefits, but there's a divine agenda in the heart of God why he wants to bring you in into covenant. May the Lord bless his soul in our heart in the name of Jesus. Thank you so much. Hallelujah! We believe you have been blessed by this wonderful teaching. Other SGS teachings are available on our YouTube channel. Kindly do well to like, subscribe, and turn on the notification icon in order to receive updates about our SGS teachings. You can also drop your comments and questions after the broadcast. We also have the compressed audio version of this teaching and other teachings on our Telegram platform. Join us again next week for another round of Encounter with God. Remain blessed. Shalom.